I'd like to introduce our final speaker of this session, which is Scott Ellis. Scott's first memory of canoe tripping is a four-night journey on the Connecticut River as a camper at a YMCA camp in Connecticut. Canoe tripping is inspiring for Scott because he feels there's something special about having all of your stuff in one boat. It's simple, simple thoughts, simple technology. Scott is currently based in White River Junction, Vermont, where he lives with his wife and his newborn baby daughter, who is currently the center of his world. He also works for L.L. Bean, currently, managing the outdoor programs in the area. Scott is here at the symposium to share his canoe trip stories and visuals. Scott often films his canoe journeys. He thinks it's important to access the tools of today's generation to encourage and inspire them to lead an outdoor lifestyle. He's here today to share his filmmaking experiences through his presentation entitled Connecting Rather Than Conquering Nature with Digital Filmmaking. Welcome, Scott. All right, well, uh, thank you so much for having me here today. I stand very humble in front of this great group of people. Um, a lot of you guys have done some amazing things and gone on trips that I can only dream of. Uh, so my presentation today is not about a crazy trip or a headwind or a killer portage. Um, it's more about how I document my trips and how I've been able to merge my camping skills and styles with modern technology and social media. And all of this is with an idea to connect people to nature. All right. Um, so one thing I love almost as much as going on trips is uh, going back and looking at my old pictures of my trips. And I'm also eager to share those with friends, family, or just about anyone who will sit through one of my slideshows. Uh, so thank you guys all for sitting through one of my slideshows today. Um, and in 2008, I did a really cool trip with some friends on the Rupert River, um, which really changed my perspectives in a couple ways. It made me realize what these big grand rivers were about. But also something different on that trip, we shot video. Um, and I hadn't really done video before. And when I got back from the trip, looking at all of that video, it changed everything. It, made, it brought me back to that experience in a new way and made me fall in love with that new idea. Um, I'm also the kind of guy that just loves watching every video I can find on outdoor trips, uh, especially paddling trips. And uh, one thing I've noticed in my passion to consume every outdoor film I can find both good and bad, um, is that the mainstream media right now is continually portraying nature as something dangerous that we have to overcome. It's this foreign thing. Um, and I disagree with that perspective. There are uh, TV stars out there like Bear Grylls. Um, he doesn't go outside to connect or heal. Uh, he's going out there to prove how tough he is and overcome these made-up obstacles to defeat the foreign thing called nature. Um, I bet almost everyone in this room has been on more real adventures than Bear Grylls has ever thought about. Um, and that's not why we go out there. We go out there because we want to connect. Uh, and it feels good when we're out there. Um, there's also a, a real need right now, I think, for real films about real wilderness adventures and the people who are going on them. And so I'm hopefully trying to fill some of that need. Um, this is where it all kind of ties in with my life goal. Uh, I have this goal in everything I do, in my profession, my friends, and everything. I want to get as many people as possible outside. I know that nature is healing, and I want everyone to have those positive effects that it can have on us. I also know that the more people we have on our team to help protect these wild places, that's gonna be better. You know, there's gonna be a time where we need these people to come with us. And if we get them out there on these trips, uh, they're gonna be with us to help. Now, uh, the idea to use my new passion for shooting video along with my life goal came about as many good ideas do around a campfire with a few good friends. Um, we were talking and we realized, you know, everybody's saying now, we're all so stuck on our technology. Everybody now is on their phones and their computers. You go into any coffee shop and you see the youth out there, they're, they're just stuck on that screen all the time. And I think it's even more necessary now to find ways to get people off of those devices and get them out into the woods. I've also found that uh, if you force or tell someone that they need to do something like this, it rarely works. 
So I'm taking a different approach. I'm going to come at them through the technology. Um, I'm embracing it. I, I am in this generation as well, and I'm going to use this technology as my tool to help inspire others. Um, I'm coming at the youth through those phones and those coffee shops, and I'm using the best video platform out there right now, I think, to share your experiences, YouTube. Um, so I've started a YouTube page called Guide You Outdoors with a good friend of mine named Austin, and uh, we share videos about just about anything outdoorsy that we could come up with. Everything we love to do, we're making videos about. Um, we try to inspire, inform, and entertain our viewers. We currently have about 6,000 subscribers and about half a million views, and we've been live for about a year and a half, so we're, we're doing pretty good. Um, Austin right now is actually really cool. He's just taken a year to travel across the country, visit cool places, make videos about everywhere he goes, and then putting them up on the tube. Um, you can see a sample of some of our videos that we have on YouTube and just kind of see the diversity of what we have. I got a video on how to make rock climbing tree anchors, a uh, gear review on a dog backpack, how to keep squirrels from eating your food if you're in a shelter using a, a little tuna can thing, backcountry skiing. I've laid out all my canoe gear in one. I went camping all by myself for a little while, and we document all those. So there's, there's a wide variety of films that we have out there. The page has also led to some really good opportunities like speaking at symposiums, um, being on PBS, uh, the outside television, and the Weather Channel are some opportunities that we've had. And overall, YouTube has is, is given us this tool to reach a much larger audience and really get the word out there. Now, the members of the audience today do not need to be inspired or educated about getting outside. I think you guys got that already. Um, what I share, wanna share with you all today is more a notion of you two can make these types of videos. Um, I have no professional videography experience. Um, I'm not in this to make money. Uh, and really, I'm just a guy that likes to go on trips, and I bring my camera, and I shoot some stuff. When I get home, I edit it up a little bit, and then I throw it up on YouTube. Out in the field, I carry a really simple kit. That's my whole philosophy with this is keep it simple. You don't want to get overwhelmed. It's easy with all this stuff to get into 1080p and 4K and what is the resolution. Don't worry about that stuff. Like, just get out there and shoot. So I have a simple camcorder, a uh, simple audio recorder. I love taking time lapses. So I have this cool thing that spins around when you do a time lapse. Um, some SD cards, tripod, GoPro cameras is a great resource. I know in a lot of the slides we're seeing people are using them. Use them, take some video with it. You can get some really cool stuff. And then there's also a picture here with a, a wooden stick. I like to make canoe paddles. And so I had a scrap piece once and I just made like a walking stick that I attached my GoPro to the end of, and that's where I always keep my GoPro. So it's ready, it's accessible. Whenever I need a shot, if there's an animal or whatever, and then being on a stick, you can kind of stick it out and get all these creative, cool things. One of my favorite shots is I'll, I'll lash this wooden stick to the gunnels of my canoe, and then if it's out on the side and you lean the boat, the camera goes into the water, and then when you lean back, the camera comes out of the water, and you can get some really fun shots. And that's really the beauty. It kind of adds to the whole element of my experience out there in the woods is coming up with ways to get some really cool shots. Um, so speaking of getting all those shots, once you get home, you got to do something with all of that footage. Nobody wants to see the 17 hours of raw footage you shot out there. Um, so you're going to have to edit it down. Now, luckily enough, there's a lot of software out there, and this is actually pretty easy. Um, if you've been out there and had a lot of footage, don't be intimidated by this. There's a lot of programs. I started off with iMovie, and I'll still use it sometimes. Um, it's a free program that comes on all Mac computers. It has its limits, but it's super user-friendly. And just kind of in this picture here, the bottom part is all my raw footage. I can highlight any section I want drag it up into that top left section, and in there I can add stills, I can add audio, transitions, and then the little right screen is just giving you a taste of the different types of shots I've got. Um, it really comes down to the whole philosophy. Keep it simple, keep it fun. If this becomes a job, then it's not what you want to do anymore. This is supposed to just be a hobby. Um, so, to wrap it up a little bit, but I want to just kind of recap that you know, making films about my trips, it's just a whole lot of fun. Um, and I feel there's a strong need for videos that portray nature as positive and healing. I want to inspire everyone to get outside. A new technology like GoPro cameras, iMovie software, and YouTube have given me the tools to reach this large audience. 
And for the most, we can preserve these amazing journeys that you are all going on for future generations to see. And I think there's a lot of power in that. So I'm going to show you some films, uh, and I'll do some less talking. We haven't seen a film today, actually, which is cool. So I get to be the first one. Um, and actually, the films I'm showing you today are little snippets of full-length films that you will find on the Guide You Outdoors YouTube page, which I hope all of you visit when you go home and check it out and see what's on there. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip from uh, a guide I made to La Verondry, which I butchered probably with my pronunciation, but a uh, really cool park in Quebec. I also did a trip on the Allagash in northern Maine with the legendary Gil Gil Patrick. Um, there's a cool moment where I met a through hiker of the Appalachian Trail and we shared a shelter for the night and she told us her story. And then also I just went on a little winter solo camping trip in the backwoods of Vermont around where I live. Um, so yeah, on with the show. You guys ready for a film? Yeah. All right. This is Guide You Outdoors, where we guide you to the outdoor lifestyle. Do you want to watch some cool videos that inspire and inform you to get outside? Then check out the Guide You Outdoors YouTube page. We're just a bunch of fun-loving guys that love to play in the woods, so won't you come along and join us for a good old time. Welcome to another Guide You Outdoors video, where we guide you to an outdoor lifestyle. This video is a guide to canoeing in La Verondrie Wildlife Preserve. By showing you this film, I hope to inspire and prepare you for going on your very own canoeing adventure. Although this video is a guide for La Verondrie, many of the skills and information are appropriate for all types of trips. So if you're interested in the idea of going on a canoe trip, then come and explore La Verondrie. Welcome to this segment on portaging. Welcome, and here we are landing at the portage trail. This is a 175 meter portage. And I'd like to show you exactly how efficient we are at doing this whole system. First thing we're gonna do is load Kelsey up. She gets the barrel first. We lift together, one, two, three. Help her get that on. Make sure those shoulder straps are straight. And once she's ready, she'll take this jellyfish and put it on her front. I like to hook the straps all the way up to over the barrel so the weight is more on the barrel and not on the front of her shoulders. Her water bottles, she likes to clip nice and close in the side of the bag. And then I'm going to give her just a walking stick, which is the paddle. She's off. That's all she needs. And that's half the load. Life oh, life jackets, we almost forgot. The last thing, clip onto the back of the barrel, just like so. Good to go. And Kelsey's load is on. So now that she's gone, I just gotta get my last things ready. And really, the trick is simplicity. Water bottle in the bag, pack on. If you look here, I got my uh, maps and my fishing tackle and my raincoat and everything are right in there, strapped down. Kelsey has a little pack in the front, strapped down, that has her rain gear in it. Now take these paddles and I shove them underneath this seat and I have little bungees just on my center yoke. So now boat's ready to go. It's just time to pick it up and carry it, right? So I take it up to my lap, reach across, up high, right hand underneath the boat. One, two, three, snap. She's up. All right, folks, I'm ready to go portaging. Let me show you one more angle of the lift. You know, picking up the boat by yourself is a skill that many people struggle to master. I suggest practicing in your backyard with a spotter before you head out on a trip. Remember, it's a lot more about technique than brute force. The next part of portaging is really straightforward. It's just walking with a big, heavy, awkward thing on your head. One thing to keep in mind is to make sure the boat is balanced well. If you tie anything down, make sure there's an equal weight in the front and the back. I also try to stay focused on my breathing and footing, but sometimes I just can't help but get distracted by all the beauty around me. A 
Let's see. I'm a little stuck. A little bit stuck. Just a little. Uh, what's that? You would say just below the knee right there. This is muskeg swamp. Yeah. All right, I really Kel. tried to avoid the mud, but it didn't happen. Yeah. Right. Come on. Get it out of there. Well, oh, no shoe. I see it. I see the shoe down there. Don't lose it. This I feel like I'm birthing a shoe. Ah, oh, look at that shoe. Nice. Good work. That's how you get unstuck. That's how you get out of a portage, stuck. Muskeg, see this swamp? Don't step in that. comfortably and cushy and that's all we need right there one load pick up your stuff out of the boat put it in the boat save as much energy as you can so you have more energy to paddle run rapids do all sorts of fun things here in Verdre I would like to show you all the different types of terrain that La Verendre has to offer it's amazing how diverse one park can be. Of course, there is a vast amount of flat water in a variety of different sized lakes. Some lakes, like Dos Wall, are miles across in some places, and other small lakes and ponds you can skip a stone across. If you love feeling like you are the only person on the planet as you glide across a pristine remote lake with no houses or signs of people, and you need to come to La Verendre. There are also some great rivers within the park. My favorite is the Shoshawan. On river routes, you will run into a wide variety of different obstacles that will challenge you in different ways. You will also find that you may need to make choices about how you will get through different sections. For example, you may come across a clearly marked rapid with a well-maintained portage trail. Just because there is a portage trail doesn't mean you have to take it. You may choose to run the rapid. Maybe you can line or walk the boat down. You could also portage your gear and run it with an empty boat. There is always a delicate balance between safety, fun, and efficiency that I consider before each obstacle. One of my favorite parts of any river route is the rapids. If you're not sure about running a rapid, it's always wise to get out and scout. If it looks safe and fun, then go for it and have a blast. I also really enjoy the quiet, misty mornings on the water. It's sometimes a challenge to wake up at 4.30 a.m. and get all packed up, but some of my most special moments on canoe trips are those early morning paddles. On the Shoshawan River, we loved how around every turn there is something new and different. You may start the day camping on a long beach in a big lake. After a portage, you then find yourself dragging the boat up a tiny rocky creek. Next thing you know, there's a beaver dam you have to get over. Then you find yourself in a meandering small stream surrounded by bogs and pitcher plants. Around the next turn, you're in a tiny pond choked with lily pads and snake grass. It's all part of the adventure and it keeps you wondering what will be around the next bend.
Having fun when you're out on a trip should never be a problem. There are so many great things to do to fill your days. Let me show you some of my favorite fun activities out there. Hey, and don't let this list stop you from coming up with your own fun games. Gunnel bumping is always a fun way to test your balance and teamwork. If you're looking to step up the challenge, try the gunnel walk pass by move. This one can really test your limits of what's possible with excellent teamwork. If the boat ends up capsizing, then no problem. Just swim underneath and hang out under the upside down boat. It's one of those things everyone should do at least once in their life. Rock climbing is another passion of mine. You can't take any unnecessary risks when you're deep in the wilderness. But when I find solid rock right over deep water, I just can't resist climbing around a little. It's also fun to take the quick way down when you get to the top. Once again, safety is important, so always check the water before you jump. You gotta remember that this is a vacation, so chill out, take a nap, go fishing, or jump around on logs. Try catching crayfish, check out the wildlife, sing songs with the white-throated sparrow, snuggle with your dog, pick blueberries, have a pirate party, juggle some logs, play home run derby, eat a rainbow, or mess around on floating bogs, and always go swimming every day. Enjoy the whole experience and appreciate the finer moments of every aspect of your trip. And uh, even if you don't see it right now, everything is changing. The rocks over time, the river. The river, you can see it flowing but the rocks and the trees and our lives are always flowing. And I think it ends with uh, just like, I think this, the quote is like, and stars like globules in the, in the pounding heart of our universe. And I just think, I was thinking about that today about how I feel like hikers, all, I think about sometimes the bigger picture of these hikers, we're all kind of like blood cells in those arteries of our, of our natural forests. And, you kind of all have that place and you meet each other and there's moments that you're supposed to meet and I've noticed that that on trail you really you have those moments when paths do meet and they're supposed to meet and there's just a uh, on trail and in the woods you can it's so, a simpler life and so you can trust more in those things that are supposed to happen instead of in a city in city life where we feel everything's really overwhelming and it's hard to know what is meaningful everything feels strongly on trail and in the forest because you know you're really living so all the highs are highs and lows are low so especially if I'm mean, on my own so when I'm feeling bummed out and sad it's like depths you know it's really hard and you start to see really just dark places inside yourself, but when you're happy and when you're experiencing things, it's that's like the top of the mountain, literally, and inside you. Gillis traveled these waters over a hundred times in his homemade cedar strip canoe. He's the author of the Allagash Guidebook and a celebrity on the water. He and the river have become tied together in an interconnected relationship that bonds them like rain and light creating a rainbow. True and convenient adventures can be hard to find. The encroaching push of civilization with its sofas and cell towers advance upon our wild places, making it more difficult to find an honest adventure. The Allagash still exists today as it did 40 years ago. Gill even remembers specific trees that have stood the test of time and hardship. Just before Round Pond lives an old perfect V-shaped elm tree near the river bay. Over the past 40 years, Dutch elm disease has nearly wiped out this species in New England. But here on the Allagash, this tree survives. And Gill was happy to see his old friend when we rounded the bend. In this video, I'm heading off for an overnight solo winter camping trip. 
Join me as I pull a sled of gear to a secluded spot in the Vermont wilderness. When we get to camp, I'll show you how to make an inexpensive hot tent teepee shelter, and I will reveal how wilderness excursions help bring me back to sanity. I hope this video will inspire you to get outdoors and feel what it is like to be alone in the wilderness. The whole idea is to come out here alone to kind of gain a little bit of sanity. And it's a beautiful day. It's about six degrees taken off. Um, all my gear seems to be going well. The sled's pulling well, snowshoes are on, dogs having fun. And uh, this is one of my favorite parts. It's like the leave into the journey. You know, it all starts from here. I've been thinking about doing this for a little while and now I can just think about what I'm doing rather than what I'm going to do. No tracks, that's a really good sign. Um, that means that nobody's been up here in a while. We had about nine inches of snow three days ago, and nobody in the last three days has been up this track. You know, today's important. Uh, food, water, shelter are your important keys when you are out camping and uh, I brought food. I have a good bit of water still and the shelter is going to be the big job of the day. That's going to take me a while. Um, to make the initial structure for the teepee, loosely lash together three poles, then stand them up to form a tripod. Now you can lean the rest of your poles on that structure. To secure all the poles in place, just wrap a long rope around the top. Looks really solid. Yeah, TP up, baby. And now it is tarp time. Um, I just picked up an inexpensive painter's clear plastic tarp. Um, I went cheap, and hopefully that was a good choice. And uh, I cut it into a half circle. Um, I did that by using a, a pen on a string to go all the way around and make a half circle and then cut that out. Now when you bring that together, it should create a perfect cone. Well, and it looks like we're gonna have a fire in here. It's kind of beautiful living in a teepee. It's a, it's a peaceful kind of thing. A teepee is kind of a cool shelter in a way. It's traditional, it's Native American obviously. And uh, it works, like cheap tarp around me here. Collected some logs, carried up a little wood stove, and it's the middle of the winter. It's uh, probably, I don't know, five, six degrees outside right now. It's snowing, and I'm toasty warm inside of here. All good things always come to an end. After some exploring and reflection, I decided it was time to head home. So I packed up all my gear and guided my sled back to the car.